how to turn your omni-channel digital experiences from dreams to reality. With an open digital experience platform, or DXP, you can build and manage digital experiences across multiple channels, such as websites, portals, email, and mobile, keeping the visitor at the center at all times. And that while being connected with your existing ecosystem and back end, such as your preferred CRM, ERP, and digital asset management solutions by managing content, websites, and environments in Drupal and Drupal Cloud. Building marketing campaigns across sites, email, and mobile with Modic Marketing Automation and adding data-driven personalization driven by an open customer data platform, you know me. Developers can manage projects and environments in Drupal Cloud. In fact, not just Drupal, also Symfony, Modic, or Node projects. Collaboration, code reviews, and deployments have never been easier with integrated GitLab repositories, very detailed and transparent information, logging and various CI CD features. Compliance and security will love the full history logging. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dominic. I'm a co-CEO and co-founder of DropSolid. And it's my pleasure to introduce the, the Drupal core initiative team. And it's really a pleasure for me because without this team, we would not be able to build our product because Drupal, as you can see, it's, it's a central component. It's the heart of the product. And these people, they are the heart of the Drupal project. So give it up for the core initiative team. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this keynote. So before we start, I don't know if you've been here in the break, but we are in the last minutes of our little rooster auction. So the rooster is looking for their final home. And we are at this stage right now, but we only have 22 minutes left. So somewhere in the middle of our session, uh, the rooster's final home will be decided. So if you go to the app, you have a chance to bid for the little rooster and then pick from five different organizations and pick which one you would like to donate that money to. So that goes to a good cause. So that's one reason to use the app while we're here. The other reason to use the app is to ask questions to uh, all of the initiatives leads here. So please use the app to do that. And at the end, we'll have some Q&A, hopefully, if we have time for that. So with that. Let's start with the Drupal Initiative Leads keynote for DrupalCon Lil. We are here to do this because I think it's really important to get together and to see all of these people, to, for you to meet all of them and to see what they are working on. And more importantly is for you to see that they are really friendly and they would like to work with you all to make Drupal better in all of these areas. And I think what's really unique about DrupalCon especially is we have a very wide breadth of different people attending. So we'll have very developer-focused uh, talks here. We will, be, we will have very, uh, very uh, UI-focused talks. We will talk about developer tools. We will talk about promotion of Drupal. So a lot of different aspects that you could be involved with and you may be interested in. But this is all what makes Drupal happen. We need all of these roles to contribute and all of these roles to pitch in their part. And that's what will make Drupal successful. So first of all, we'll start with um, a developer-focused talk with Wim Leers. Hey, so I'm Wim. I work for Acquia's Drupal Acceleration team. And actually, I want to start with saying thanks to 
Borison, who's sitting over there from Calibrate, without whom many of these slides would have been much emptier. And yes, you may also be wondering, is that even a strategic initiative? And you're right, it isn't. But it is an initiative, or it's a, a grassroots thing, if you will, that is really going to help a lot of strategic initiatives, including, for example, recipes, automatic updates, and maybe you care less about conflict validation, but maybe more about these high-level things like writing v config via JSON API, GraphQL REST. Maybe you care more about more reliable advanced conflict management. Or maybe what you really care about is improved uh, end-user experiences. But let me give you some context. Why do, are we doing this? So in 2004, we start with a variable table. Key value pairs, the values are blobs of arrays of doom. So blobbiness is off the charts. Then in 2012, we moved it to YAML files. We made it diffable. Then we made it introspectable and translatable by schemas. And then we moved it back to the database performance. And then we added validation constraints. But this, this is where we are at today, or at least a few months ago, in terms of how many things you can actually write or validate via JSON API or GraphQL. So we're nowhere, but the infrastructure actually exists, and that's really unfortunate. So I believe we can do better. I think we should be aiming for this, where only um, the few lines on the right-hand side of the screen uh, need to be changed or added, and you get the experience on the left-hand side of the screen, where you get the familiar error messages uh, when validating something. But those same messages should be appearing also in GraphQL, JSON API, and other places. Unfortunately, this is the number, uh, the percentage rather, of types of config in Drupal core that are validatable back in December. And on the right-hand side is the only validatable piece of config type. So UUIDs is the only thing, and every UUID is a string, but not every string is a UUID. And that is why we need validation to make sure it's actually what it is saying that it is. Back in December, we had 598 config types in Drupal core, 27 of which were validatable. That's a lot of work. It's like a dizzying amount of work left to be done. And of those 27, 17 were just Booleans, and Booleans do not have additional shapes besides true and false. So since December, we worked very hard to make sure that as many things in Drupal core and contrib we'd actually move forward significantly in terms of how much of it was already validatable. So we made things like labels validatable, config dependencies, and we added new types, for example, machine name and line code that are terms that are familiar to many of you. So today we're in a much better place. Today we're at 634 types in total. There's things that have been added in the meantime, but 56 are validatable, so more than twice as many. And two of those, two of those 56 are config entity types. Menus and shortcut sets, config entities, in principle are now fully validatable. We just need to start using it in JSON API, for example. So if we zoom out from the types, which is really low level, and look at a fresh standard install profile, um, we went from nothing being validatable to 6% of everything in the standard install profile being fully uh, validatable. Note that I say fully validatable. There's also partially validatable things. In fact, Back when we started, 27% of everything in Drupal core was already validatable. So the parts, the bits and pieces inside of config. And now we're at more than half. So we're very much making progress, but getting to 100% is going to take some time. But even then, even at this point in time, I'm happy to say that this screen that I showed actually just the same exact slide before, that is actually not a dream or an ambition. That is a reality today. In Drupal 10.2, this is possible. As soon as you update an existing simple config form to use validation constraints, it really is true that you only need to add those few lines to have it work in your config form. And so that's the first change record, actually, that I wanted to show you. Uh, config form base now optionally supports validation constraints in Drupal 10.2. So it's going to be possible with a few lines of code being changed. After that, all you will have to do is add more validation constraints to your config schema. The other really important changes in Drupal core, there is this trait with a really long name. It's being used in every single test in Drupal core and contrib, and it has been checking your existing config uh, already, but now it's going to also be ver uh, verifying that it's matching the validation constraints. And we're gonna make sure, of course, it's not going to disrupt contrib. So, if any of this interests you, even in the slightest bit, if any of the high-level concepts that I showed you before, maybe, for example, writing config via JSON API, then these are the issue tags that you can use to find every uh, issue in Drupal core and contrib um, to follow along or to contribute. 
And we made it also really easy to contribute or to start exploring where things are at for your modules or your projects. The Config Inspector module now has uh, additional columns on the right-hand side that provide rich metadata. So you see, I know it's too small to read, but that's fine. The yellow warning signs, those actually tell you precisely which types still need to be updated to have validation constraints. And if you're exploring what could be next in Drupal core or in your module, we have a, a dash dash to do command that shows you low hanging fruit, things that are almost fully validatable, and high hanging fruit, things that if we were to make them validatable would help pretty much the entire ecosystem. So we're making it easy to find the next thing to work on. So let's first get Drupal core to 100% validatability. It's going to be quite a bit of work. There's a talk later today at five in which I'm going to do two live hands-on demos and you'll walk away with knowing exactly what to do for your module or for core. So join us at the sprints tomorrow. Come find Boris or me and let's do it. Thank you. Yeah, I told you it's going to be a deep developer topic, but you care about this because you want your deployments to go smooth and you want your automated updates to go smooth and you want your headless applications to go smooth. So these, this is the care that goes into enabling all of those underlying things and I really like the developer experience improvements that show you and help you prioritize where you can make the biggest impact uh, faster. So our next topic is quite different, but is also really close to my heart. Uh, so Felipe is going to talk to us about localized.drupal.org, which I helped create uh, way back in the day. And it enables us all to translate Drupal into all of the world's languages and bring Drupal to everybody on the globe. And it's very important to take care of. So let's give it up for Felipe. Thank you. Before presenting the localized port initiative, please let me pay tribute to a great Catalan linguist who dies this year. Car Carme Julien was always concerned with preserving linguistic diversity. More than a way of communicating, languages bear both social as well as even ecological value. Only a few of them are written languages, but it is important to ensure they can all be used on the internet Hence, all the efforts that have been made throughout the history of Drupal, particularly since the release of Drupal 8 and its multi multilingual API. The localized.drupal.org platform, currently built in Drupal 7, enables the community to translate Drupal core and country projects, as well as share the translations. Any of you, many of you who installed Drupal in this room, transparently downloaded translation from this very platform. Some translation communities use additional tools as a glossary, for, for instance, or they may wonder how they could retrieve statistics from localized. And that means we, we should expose web services from localized. And that was one, one of the first reasons I got involved in this initiative. And why we were inquiring people so this initiative uh, originated in Ghent, and we are uh, um, translators, developers, UX designers, and local communities members, all interested in improving this platform and making the translation process easier. And while we were inquiring people, um, we had the feeling that translation communities were a bit isolated from each other. And joining this initiative is certainly a great way of knowing each other, and of knowing how we could help them. Um, so while maintaining a permanent team is certainly not so easy, uh, we're glad all those people have been contributing uh, to this initiative for the last few months, particularly people like Stefan, who wrote a lot of code. It is still time to join us here in Lille, in Country Broom, or later on on the internet. Now. Uh, what is the current status of the initiative? We're still at the first phase, that is, we uh, at the initial port phase, where we're porting features from the Drupal 7 platform to the Drupal 10 platform. And as you can see, we now have a working uh, D10 backbone, which is still alpha, but it works, and we have uh, back-end UI as well as front-end UI, and as you can see, we can already submit suggestions and translations. 
Um, I said we were porting features as they were, but some choices uh, were a bit different. Uh, for instance, we're now using the group module, and also strings, translations, projects, and release, and so on, and our content entities. And also, someday, instead of relying on the database for search, we might actually rely on an actual indexing and search server. Um, since, <clears throat> since Drupal Dev Gantt, Drupal Dev Days Gantt, uh, some communications efforts were made at DrupalCon Prague last year, uh, in front of local user, uh, local user groups, during DrupalCon warm-up too, always was while wearing this fantastic T-shirt courtesy of the German community. Also, um, some documentation efforts have been made. We now have onboarding instructions and a roadmap, which sounds amazing, but it's certainly not so easy. Um, here at Lille, uh, we're working on migration, data migration from Drupal 7 to D Drupal 10. And when we're done with this, in collaboration with the Infra team, we'll be able to set up a staging instance so we finally have a demo. Um, that was the first phase. And during a second phase, we'll be able to bring new improvements to this platform. Um, first of all, we might expose web services, like I said, to, um, in order to, to get st statistics, for, like the French community does, or but we're already doing this thanks to Dominic, who's joined the initiative. We could resurrect the localized client module, uh, which enables uh, users to submit translations from the local instance, which is easier, and you can get more quality uh, translations. And this module it has, it was not in such a good shape, but we're going to uh, be able to use it again with the Drupal 10 instance. Also, we could implement a glossary tool that the French-speaking community does, but this time for the whole community, for all languages on Localize, which will certainly be awesome. In the team, we have, uh, we have UX designers who joined us and who worked on the interface. For instance, the filters were apparently not so easy to understand by newcomers, so we got a proposal on this aspect and others which have not yet been implemented, but they certainly will. Um, yesterday, I think, with the Drupal Association, we had both about how we could credit uh, exactly like we do on Drupal.org, so you can get your credits, the number of, of strings and translated uh, directly on your profile on your Drupal.org profile. So, all in all, we are still in the initial port phase. Much work has been done. You can help, as well as you will help, you, you, you will be able to help when we are at the second phase, the improvement phase. Um, you can join us on Slack, hashtag localize, or here during DrupalCon Lille, tomorrow, for instance, uh, in Country Broom. You may flash this QR code to uh, um, consult a fantastic roadmap and onboarding instructions, or you may even decide to join our weekly meetings. Thank you for, for, thank you for, for listening to, to my presentation. Thank you, Philippe. Yeah, this, as you've seen, this is really an initiative that you, could be, you can be involved with if you worked with migrations or if you want to participate in the ideation of how the interaction of translation submissions should look like, or if you want to test the Drupal 10 platform that's in development right now. Uh, a recent development that uh, Offershell helped us with is a Gitpod instance that's running the Drupal 10 version of this now. So you can try it out and uh, contribute there. So we have a really easy way for you to get involved, try it out and uh, see what needs to be improved. And so now for something, again, completely different. Um, so Sasha Eggenberger, who works for GitLab, will now talk to us about, not GitLab, but the admin UI improvements that are happening in Drupal Core. Well, thank you, Gabor. So,
Today, I want to highlight some of the great things which we're currently working on. And with we, I mean we as a community, right? Um, there's so much going on, so I can just you know, include some of the things or highlight some of the things. Uh, we don't have time for everything. So Drupal has historically a steep learning curve, right? I think most of you in this room know that. Um, that's a hard fact because Drupal is powerful uh, Drupal is heavy, but you can build complex products with it, right? So it's normal um, that you have like a hurdle to take to learn Drupal. So how we want to improve that is by giving site builders the tools they need to make Drupal less complicated. And that sounds very easy, right? But it's a hard task to fulfill. And this really matters as site builders are the ones who build the actual user or content editor experience, right? It's not in our hands. So by reducing the time it takes for them to reach that goal is our key. So making Drupal the tool of choice for ambitious site builders on the open web. You know, that's like a bold, bold, bold claim. Um, but as I mentioned, there's so many great things currently happening in core, in initiatives, in country modules, um, that we just have to combine them somehow. So in a nutshell, like making Drupal less complicated, cutting down the learning curve, and improving the out-of-the-box experience. And I think this is the key part, because if you install Drupal, you don't have the knowledge of all those modules out there, right? So let me some examples of how we're going to improve that. So one great example is Field UI, uh, where you get this nice new UI where we improve the page building experience by prioritizing fields, make it able to group, providing information on reuse, um, so it's an easier, faster, and better way for site builders to create or model their content types. And then on the other end, we have content editors. So we want to improve the editorial experience for them, um, improving layout builder, combining the strength of you know like structured content with modern um, page building tools. So creating an intuitive user experience as a whole. And part of that is also a new navigation experience. You know, how do you access this data? You know, how do you access content? Because historically, we have a navigation which um, is, is solely focused on site admins and, and site builders. And we want to change that to incorporate uh, content editors as well. To do that, we also need to modernize the admin UI as a whole, because the new navigation might not fit in all those things, right? So a layout redesign is something we discussed for many years, and we already incorporated something similar in the Chin Admin theme, and bringing more customization to those things, like accent color and dark mode. Another great example is Project Browser, because this is really key for newbies, um, you know, like to have a place where you can go and search for modules which might fulfill your needs for what you're actually trying to solve. Um, so Chris will talk about that a bit later. And I mentioned it in the beginning because sometimes we just you know, highlight all the great things which are happening around core or initiatives. Um, but there is also so much innovation happening in Contrib. And I will just highlight a couple of them because we don't have time for everything. So the dashboard might make a return. You know, you might be familiar with the dashboard from Drupal 7, but this time we aim for a complete different experience. So that means providing a more relevant and uh, personalized experience tailored to the user's needs, right? Um, or on the other hand, we have like modules like the same page preview. You know, this is a handy module where it increases the content editor confidence in the changes by having like this side-by-side -side view where you add a content on one side and you have a live preview on the other side, right? So you're actually seeing what you're doing. Um, that's a great, great little module there. Or I might be biased here, but the Chin admin theme as well, right? So we're still trying to integrate everything in Chin first, which is or which might be out of scope for Core or Claro particularly. And we're trying to iterate on those things, you know, innovate and bringing up ideas which we later then might be able to integrate into core. So there was a lot to take here, um, right? So I highlighted some of the great things, but how do we actually approach them from a design point of view? So there's like a, a process behind it, how we validate those things. Um, 
So we highlighted that in our session earlier today, Christina and myself, and we have like three main personas we're looking at, which are like the site builder, the, the site administrator, and the content editor. And they all have completely different needs. You know, there might be some overlap, but they want to try to fulfill like different tasks. So we need to ask the right questions to solve their issues. And we integrated like a design process where you might all be very familiar with, where we do like user research, user interviews, we're creating prototypes, iterating on those prototypes, and then we start building the stuff in Contrib because we can move forward way faster in Contrib than we can do in Core. Um, so yeah, you know, you might ask yourself, do I have a place in this? And the answer is yes, of course, because we need more people to help out with all of this, right? And this is not like a finished list, it's just like a few couple of things I picked here. So you can go either to any of these Slack channels you see on the left, um, so they're more topic-based, um, you know, you might have an, a strong um, focus on what you actually would like to help us with. Um, they have weekly or bi-weekly meetings, which usually are in text form, or of course, because we're all here at DrupalCon, you can join us at the contribution day tomorrow. And I would really like to welcome you all. Um, go to any of the initiative leads, uh, or just show up at the, at the room, and we'll find the, the right place for you. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. So there's a really a lot of things going on in Drupal Core right now in terms of uh, how we can improve the admin UI. Uh, so it's great to see this overview. And next up, we picked one of them. We could have gone into all of these in a lot more detail, but there were some sessions before and some sessions after this keynote that you can get more information of. So we picked the admin toolbar because that's, I think, the furthest ahead of all of these uh, efforts. And Mike will talk to us about that. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Herschel. I am from Florida in the United States. I work for a company called Agilina. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about the Admin Toolbar Initiative, which, by the name, if you haven't got this, we aim to replace the default core Drupal administrative toolbar. And I want to specifically highlight a lot of key people that have contributed to this because it is, it is a huge, huge group effort. Um, I want to highlight some companies that have put in some dedicated resources, time and money, and that would be Lullaba, Acquia, and One X Internet. And without them, we would not be even close to where we are. So this is where we're not going. Um, <laughs> This is, yeah, this is Drupal 7 uh, right here. But you can, I want to like draw attention to the admin toolbar and how close it is to Drupal's 8 admin toolbar. There, like the look and feel has changed, but the overall information architecture has largely stayed the same. Um, even as Drupal core has rapidly innovated, this has stayed the same. And so many people will install modules such as the uh, admin toolbar module or the coffee module to help them navigate around and just make the overall user experience better. A lot of people also go with the Jin toolbar module when coupled with Sasha's Jin theme, kind of makes a, a very, very modern experience. Uh, Jin has been doing an amazing job with prototyping different ideas, some of which are good, some of which are bad, but all of them which are super innovative. Um, and that has led to this. So I'm sure you all are just kind of excited to see what this looks like. And this is uh, a little video I have of just clicking around using the admin toolbar. And you can see it feels very modern. It feels, I don't know, it feels great in my opinion. And, and I, I just get really excited when I look at this type of stuff. It also has a, uh, a collapsed mode, where, which gives you a little bit more screen real estate. And of course, you have those flyouts that pop out, and then you can kind of navigate around with that. So a lot of work has been done on the design of this. I want to give uh, some special shout outs to Christina Chumias, uh, Jared Poncha, and Jen Witowski of Lullabot. But so I, I want to emphasize that these have not just been designed and then implemented. They have been designed, 
tested, iterated, and then designed, tested, and iterated over and over again. Uh, the mobile designs look like this. They were recently implemented, so when you download that, you can, you can see how this mobile, we want to do usability testing to see if this mobile experience feels as, you're, as you would expect. Um, as part of the overall information architecture plan of this, we've, we're, we're redoing the content creation menu, which does almost, ex almost exactly what you think it does. You can create new nodes, uh, but not just nodes, but like media entities, taxonomy terms, potentially user accounts. And we're, we're looking at the overall information architecture of the administrative menu in general. So as you know, sometimes Finding, finding where things are within the admin menu can be very difficult. We've, we've sent out uh, surveys and card sorting surveys to, show, to, to ask people how they would categorize this. And that graph that you saw is, shows the correlations with that. There's a whole bunch of uh, usability testing that has gone on and that is currently going on. We've done lots of internal testing. We've done uh, some testing at the University of Minnesota in the United States. Uh, some of the questions that we're asking is, what are the main challenges for people who are not familiar with Drupal? Like, how do they navigate around? How can they find their way around the administrative UI of Drupal? What about experienced users like you and I that actually come to DrupalCons? Uh, how do we perceive these new features? And how do we find new features? If we're adding something new into Drupal Core, how are you, how are you made aware of this? These are all really good questions, and we need your help with this. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how you can help out in just a little bit. One of the things that's really, really important for this, um, for this whole admin UI initiative is for it to feel good. You know, it just doesn't need to look good. It doesn't need to be organized good. It needs to feel good at your core. We want this to feel premium. We want these animations to be smooth. We want all the jank removed so when you reload the page, things don't like randomly pop in. We just want it to appear and be quick and look smooth. Accessibility as a core Drupal gate is very important. We don't want to just meet WCAG standards. We don't, we don't, we're not doing the minimum. We want to exceed this. We want when someone with assistive technology uses this toolbar, we want it to be seamless. We want it to be a joy to use. We're planning on having dedicated screen reader and accessibility testing to make sure that this happens. There have been a lot of lessons that we learned from the Olivero theme. A lot of work went into the Olivero theme's primary menu system. And all these lessons are being applied to this. And, and these are all, it involves all different types of uh, accessibility and usability testing. But there's still a lot of work to do. Right now, it looks good, but it's, it's not there yet. There's, there's lots of bugs, there's lots of known bugs, and I'm pretty sure there's some unknown bugs in there. So once again, we will need your help with this. So what's next? We're planning on an alpha release soon. When is soon? I'm not quite sure. Uh, you can keep an eye on that at drupal.org slash project slash navigation. Uh, as of last week, it's included as an option within the Gen Admin theme. So if you go into your theme settings and you look at the toolbars, all the way to the right-hand side, there's an option to use this. And so you can check this out and poke holes in it right away. Uh, we need testing. And when we're, ta we're talking about testing, we're not talking about to validate our ideas. We, we want to improve our ideas. So if there's something that we're doing that is not good, we want to know about this. And, and if, you, if there's ideas that we maybe have not thought about, hop in the admin UI channel and, and talk about this. Uh, user experience testing is happening right here at DrupalCon. It's going to happen tomorrow within the contribution room. Uh, I would. I am personally not going to be here because I'm going to be on my way home. But look for Christina Chumias and track her down and say, I want to help. And uh, if you don't know who she is, just go to the main mentoring uh, table and we will, we will make sure that you can help us out. So yeah, so uh, how can you help? Well, more developers are always good. We need experienced front end and back end developers. Uh, I talked about usability testing. We want you to use it on different devices. Will it work on small phones, big phones, tablets? Does it work in Safari? Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, in the admin UI channel in Drupal Slack, that's where all of our discussion is with this. 
Uh, as I said earlier, the current project page is at drupal.org slash project navigation, and we have lots of issues in the uh, issue queue above. So go to that, look for issues, submit patches or merge requests, uh, help us out, find stuff, uh, do any type of testing. So that's basically it from now. I know you all love visuals, so once again, we're, we're showing this for you right here, and if you have any oohs and ahs, now is an appropriate time to, to say that. Thank you. <laughs> so this is a great initiative to contribute to this week if you have a digital device with you that you can test this out. This, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't go uh, easier than that. Um, so next up uh, is a completely different topic again. Uh, so yet another thing that enables Drupal to work is all of the underlying infrastructure that the Drupal Association is uh, maintaining for us in collaboration with its partners. And Fran is here to talk about all of the GitLab CI improvements that have been happening recently. Hi, everyone. So a lot has been happening in GitLab CI in the last few weeks and months for core, contrib space, and Drupal.org itself. Hopefully, the next slide is going to show you some of that progress, where we're at, and what we need going forward. As many of you know, Drupal CI has been the testing ground for core and contrib for many years. We started working off with patches. We needed to adapt the system to work with merge requests. So as you can imagine, over time, there was more custom code written around it, which made the maintenance of it uh, become a bit cumbersome at times. With GitLab CI coming in, we would be able to say goodbye to the Jenkins servers that we maintain, and again, with it, all the custom code that we needed to write. Uh, GitLab runners don't require so much maintenance, uh, they are easy to extend, and um, there's plenty of documentation for them. We made available GitLab CI to all contrib modules first. Adding it to your module could not be easier. It's literally adding a predefined template through the UI after a few clicks, or you can copy paste it, and that's it. You don't need to write a single line of code. Out of the box, you get pipelines running for your project and for your merge requests that will build your project, enable it, it will validate the code for coding standards and all these other, other checks, and of course it will run the test suite of your module. Once you do that, you will see some little icons popping in in your project page next to the main branches and also next to the merge request uh, when you are working on issues. Hopefully you have seen some of these already, which is a good sign, and also you can click through it and go and check the pipeline. One of our biggest milestones, though, was moving to Drupal Core from the very beginning. Um, we built some amazing templates. We started to use all the bells and whistles from GitLab. But as you can see in there, the performance initially was far from perfect. It was even slower than the <laughs> Drupal CI. And this is where the power of the community came in. We started to tweak the, tem the GitLab templates, the GitLab runner configuration. We had some very long conversations. And after some changes, we managed to get it to run to around 30 minutes time. That was twice as fast as Drupal CI. But we didn't stop it there. We continued and we went to 20 minutes, then 15 minutes. And now we're even talking about sub 10 minute uh, runs. <laughs> Cool. That screenshot is actually the moment when it was committed to Drupal Core. I managed to get it within the million conversations I had that day, so it's their capture. Um, once we see those pipelines for Drupal Core, it looks something like this. We are building all the assets that we need. We are running multiple validation on the code, and we are running a matrix of PHP and database versions against the merge requests. Um, as you can see, that's a lot of things that need to happen. 
How did we get that fast? That's thanks to concurrency. So we are leveraging concurrency for Apache. We are running multiple jobs in parallel. And in order to do that, we also needed to adapt the scripts that run the tests on Drupal core so that we could load balance each of those jobs. Once the pipeline runs, uh, we will get this nice looking report where we can actually click through, see all the details of what went well or what went wrong. It will just point us to the file, to the line, and we will be able to also download artifacts, browse, browse through them. So, and the cool thing is that they are very easy to extend. One example of this is the code quality, which was just added recently. We get a new tab with code quality suggestions, and we even get inline suggestions in the code, in the AMR. How cool is that to get almost instant feedback on the code? Of course, we didn't want to stop in there. That was all Drupal 10. We also needed to give some love to Drupal 7, so we are working as well on the migration uh, for Drupal 7 to GitLab CI. The pipeline in here is a lot simpler, but we still do some um, validation steps. We are building the environment. Of course, we are running the tests. And the big challenge here was to actually work out with the matrix of PHP and database versions. As you can see there, at the very top, we are going as far back as PHP 5.6. So getting all of those to get to green lights wasn't easy, but we are there. So that's amazing. The issue is there. It's ready to be committed. So you will find it soon as well in Drupal 7. I'm sure many of you might be thinking about the test-only part. Many of us have tried to contribute to core. And at some point, we've been asked, can you upload a test-only path with just the test that proved that there is an error and then another one with the fixes? Well, thanks to GitLab CI, we've been able to fully automate that. Out of the box, we will get a test-only job, which will get rid of all the non-test files, keep the test files, run those tests, and therefore, it will prove that there is an error. You don't need to write an additional patch, an additional MR. Everything is done automatically. Mm. Cool. That means that over the next few months, you're going to be seeing this type of messages where we are just uh, warning that we are going to be deprecating a few things. We are, for core, we are already turning off some of the daily runs in favor of GitLab CI. OK, but we are not finished yet. And there are plenty of follow-ups for improvements and also for bugs, MariaDB. <coughs> um, you can also test the different uh, PHP database versions. Uh, you can add GitLab CI to your contrib module. It's just a few clicks away. You can use MRs instead of patches, and you can hang out in, in the GitLab channel. I don't want to finish without thanking everybody to help that helped. It was a big, big combined effort from the community and the Drupal Association. It involved all the projects that I'm enlisting there, just a few of the issues, of the core issues, uh, and all the follow-ups that I could enlist, and all the people that were there on the right. So thank you all as well for helping. Thank you, Fran. Yeah, it's amazing, like bringing, it, bringing down the test runs from almost an hour to less than 10 minutes. So as one, one people said on Slack, I, I don't even have time anymore to get my coffee. So that's a problem now. Um, OK, so um, this really enables, to, this really accelerates all the work that has been happening in core to make all of the other things happen faster, because they get faster feedback on code quality, they get faster feedback on test running, et cetera. So it enables all of the other things to go even better. Uh, so next up is yet another entirely different thing about how all of these projects that will hopefully convert to these much faster and better um, GitLab CI runners soon will get to actual users at the end. And Chris Wells is going to talk about that. Hello, everyone. I am glad you're here. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about, uh, well, what I wanted to name this piece of the presentation was like Project Browser, The Untold Story, and Lessons Learned. But I realize it's not really an untold story. It's really just been told in a lot of disparate areas, issue queues, Zoom meetings, uh, it's a lot of Slack messages, a lot. Um, so. 
where did we really start from? Where did we begin? Uh, actually, this was an idea in the issue queue as far back as 2018. And in fact, I think uh, Tim Lennon uh, not only opened that issue, but uh, it currently has it assigned to him. So just in case, like if I'm duplicating effort here, let me, let me know. But uh, it was, um, I think, April of 2021 at DrupalCon, maybe global, maybe North America, I don't know, it was one of those virtual ones in kind of the dark times when we couldn't, couldn't meet in person. But uh, that's when Dries formally announced it as a strategic initiative. And then in May, he said who this was for, right? And what a, what a project browser should do. And it should make it easy for site builders to find and install modules. So we met with Dries and we came up with our problem statement or our project brief. And focusing on that audience was super important to us at that time and now. And we had a really good head start because Matt Grasmick or Grassmash, if you ever see that come across in your uh, Composer installs as I do, had already built a sort of pretty functional prototype using Svelte on the front end and, and writing the PHP code in classes that was needed on the back end. And as a result of that, we were able to step back and really look at the problem holistically. Say, if we're going to build a project browser, what are all of the components that need to happen in order to do that? And uh, Lowry had said to me a couple of months ago, we are very good at building the thing, but we're not always very good at solving the problem. So what we did to make sure that we had our audience in mind is we split into two groups. And there was one team who was really going to be responsible for building the thing. And that's sort of the, the side of our initiative that I head up is I kind of keep my eye on the code. But the site builder subcommittee spearheaded by Leslie Glynn, those are the folks who represent our target audience and who are constantly thinking about the usability of it. Uh, they use this Japanese term, shoshin, which I practice Aikido, so I know a little bit about, is beginner's mind. If I'm new to Drupal, what am I going to experience? What is my experience going to be like? And so the first thing that, that they kind of noticed was, we hear this in, in computer science a lot, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So not to say anything, not to make any particular commentary, but the data on drupal.org that we need to source this from, not necessarily consistent, but not necessarily geared towards having a project browser. So we took a look at our designs that were built for our project browser, hat tip to Jillian Chuka and her team uh, for these designs, and we identified our three main touch points, which are really icons, quick descriptions, and the categorization of Drupal modules. And we attacked those three things first. And we looked at, we took a lot of community input, we did a lot of surveys, and we decided to come up with an approach for all three of these areas while uh, addressing them ourselves for the top 100 projects on Drupal.org. Meanwhile, the other team, the developers, were hard at work, uh, locked, locked in their basements, uh, really making, taking the prototype to something that was a lot closer to being feature complete. It's wild what uh, Midjourney gives you if you say, in the style of Ren and Stimpy, by the way. That's a really good prompt if you're interested. So we learned a lot of lessons through this uh, process. And I think most of our lessons were really about contribution. What is it like to contribute to Drupal? And we found that many of us are experts in content. The content is not the problem. The problem is the process and the procedure. And getting people to actually believe that they are empowered to make the kinds of changes that they need to make in Drupal. So we solved a lot of that by getting rid of the content issue altogether and allowing people to work on Drupal with tons and tons of of no code contributions. And I'll say, I struggle with this and I'm the initiative lead. Like, what gives me the right to recategorize Drupal's you know, projects and redo a taxonomy? And another term that I had heard, it was, it was really pretty funny back in, uh, I think in DrupalCon Portland was this idea of drive-by contributors. <laughs> People who sort of drive by and say, I wanna help, I really wanna help. 
And we decided to look at this not as a problem, but as an opportunity. So we were able to take uh, issues, get them down to so narrow of a scope that you might be able to advance four or five of them in a single contribution sprint. So get your phones out if you want to help also, because the next slide is probably the only one that has uh, actual information on it that you might need. So if you do want to help with this initiative, especially if you're a maintainer, we need you to take our suggestion, uh, suggestions for a suggested logo, a suggested short description, and pretty soon suggested categories, and get them integrated into your module on your, to get that data right. Uh, whether you're in the top 100 or not, we have people willing to help you write those or do a logo for those. And so the road ahead now, we're looking at an alpha release getting included into Drupal core. We are very close. We have only two issues that are really blocking that. And the work is really done on both of those issues. They're just waiting on some other uh, piece of the puzzle to come into place. And then as we look ahead towards uh, the beta inclusion, what we are really trying to do is finalize the UI. So if you have any expertise in usability, accessibility, um, uh, front end skills, if you want to learn a little spelt, come on by and um, we're here to help you. So if you see either of these two ugly mugs, one of them is me, one of them is Leslie, uh, please say hi. We are um, really very friendly and we would love to have you here. Um, we have a place for you and you are welcome here. Thank you, Chris. I think the Project Browser is a really great example of an initiative that, that, that not only solves the tool, the build the tool, but also tries to look at all the whole problem space that needs to have all of these other things solved for the user to get a satisfying experience. So I'm really glad that they take this uh, overarching approach, and it also gives you a lot of opportunity to contribute to that initiative as well. So uh, for our final uh, uh, talk, we'll fly a little bit higher and uh, Suzanne will introduce the Promote Drupal initiative. Thanks, Gabor. <laughs> so yeah, my name's Suzanne Degacheva. I run an agency uh, called Evolving Web, and I now play a sales and marketing role, although I started off as a Drupal developer. Um, and Promote Drupal, as you heard at the Dries Note, were a community-led initiative to really push Drupal, um, spread the word outside the community, and increase adoption. And we're really trying to do this um, at a basic level, building brand awareness for a product that has never really had uh, product marketing done for in the past. Uh, you might be familiar with some of the material we've already created using the existing Drupal brand, like this beautiful one-pager you can find on drupal.org. There's also slide decks and, and some other things. But what I want to focus on today is talking a little bit more about the groundwork that we've been laying for, for some more fundamental changes and some bigger marketing efforts. Um, so one of those things is shifting drupal.org and shifting it more towards uh, orienting the content and the experience for evaluators. So part of what we've done there is looking at personas for evaluators. Uh, we've also looked at the analytics of drupal.org. Uh, where do new users actually go? What content do we need to focus on if we're really focusing on them? Um, and in doing that, uh, be able to make more effective changes iteratively. We've also looked at the governance plan around content. If you've done any extensive web projects, maybe you've put plans like this together. And it's especially important here because we are collaborating with the Drupal Association. Uh, sometimes we're collaborating with agencies that are working on part of the, the design or the brand, um, and we need to have a good collaboration. Uh, there's a group of us that have also been iterating on Drupal's social media presence and our PR, having good press releases and uh, external communications. Um, and so this isn't something we can take for granted. You know, Drupal needs a, a strong presence in these areas as well. Part of the team has been working on wireframing. So if we are looking at those top priority pages on drupal.org, coming up with a better user experience. And uh, Shane on my team has actually even translated some of these into mock-ups so we can start to really see what, what drupal.org could feel like. 
Now, all this effort we've been putting in place, but with the formation of the marketing committee, we decided to take a step back and really think harder about the Drupal brand, and I want to talk through that a bit. It's really an opportunity to evolve the brand and um, help it better capture Drupal and express that to external audiences. Um, so Sean uh, Parrott from Acquia has been helping out with this as part of Promote Drupal. He's been working on a brand strategy, and I want to share um, up on the screen a little taste of the work he's been doing. So he, he's done some interviews with people to try to capture um, some of the, the feeling of the brand, um, some of the values, and I have some of selected quotes up here. Um, we want the brand to be really unapologetic. We want it to capture this joy of building that I think we all get when we use Drupal. Um, but we also wanted to make people realize that Drupal is something that's worth sinking your teeth into, worth, worth investing in. We want it to be really true to the spirit of Drupal, the fact that we are this community, that we believe in the open web. Um, but it's also important that it captures the benefit of that for people who don't even know what we mean by community and aren't really sure what open source means to them. And I think it's a hard thing to do, but I think we can, we can do this. So part of what we need to do is to really express the brand in a confident way, not be defensive, um, and really speak to these external audiences with all the passion that we have about, about Drupal. So what's next? We have these lovely brand uh, attributes that I'm going to show up on the screen in a second, but there's a lot of work to do to take these ideas and to translate them into a visual identity, a new visual identity that's going to capture people's imagination. We also have work to do to create a brand narrative so that we have a really consistent way of speaking with a Drupal voice that's... Uh, really going to speak to these external audiences. We want to have a tone of messaging that we can all use when we're writing case studies and writing these LinkedIn posts that, that we've been working on. Uh, so there's a whole lot of brand work that I hope uh, some of you will be excited to contribute to. There is also um, an effort to reorganize Drupal.org, so that this is something we can probably get out the door pretty quickly if we, if we uh, work hard tomorrow. Um, uh, Emma from the University of Edinburgh worked on a usability test of a new sitemap for Drupal.org that we want to get a bit of testing on and, and push out the door. Um, at the same time, if you're interested in getting involved, we really need help scaling up our efforts. So, it, you know, just like the effort around all this code contribution has been scaled up, we need to do the same thing for marketing. So if you're a project manager, if you're a marketer, we'd love to, to get you involved. Um, I want to thank everyone who's been involved so far. These are just a few of the faces that you'll see in the Promote Drupal team. Um, there's been, like I said, a lot of effort behind the scenes, things we've been working on that you haven't seen the light of day yet. So thank you, everyone, for working hard on those, on those uh, types of initiatives. And um, in terms of how you can help, um, if you just have five minutes, so that means right now, again, get out your phone and um, go to this URL. We need help with this usability test. It's to test the new um, navigation. Uh, it's a very easy tree test that you can go through pretty quickly. Um, so we'd love to get your help with that. And if you are engaged on LinkedIn, who here has LinkedIn accounts? Pretty much everyone I've talked to at the conference. So please follow the Drupal LinkedIn page, engage with the content there, um, and really consider like posting to it, tagging Drupal, um, getting engaged so that people can see the energy behind the project. Um, we'd love to, for this to keep going, so a few things you can do. You can come to the contribution day tomorrow. We have a BOF at 4.15 today in room 2.2, um, and we'd love to have you contribute in any way, so please come, talk to me. If you're a non-coder, this is the, the top way you can contribute to Drupal right now. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. So this is our time for questions. Uh, and while I get the backup iPad that did not log me out from the back, uh, I would like to ask my question is, if one of you would like to recite a mistake or something that you, that you did wrong that you learned a lot from throughout this process that you've been working on your initiative. 
<laughs> own your mistakes. Yes, pick up your mic. Um, one mistake we made early on was just to have kind of a lot of meetings to discuss marketing because people love talking about marketing <laughs> and not to organize our initiative into smaller groups and um, get project managers involved in organizing the, the work and um, having a better onboarding process for new contributors. Yeah. Yeah, for me, one of the things was um, actually not going into the cave and try to solve the problem myself. I knew that the problem was there. I tried, I tried, couldn't work. So for me, the realization moment was to reach out to the community. Uh, I mean, as many of you were on the GitLab channel, I was kind of writing every day, asking for help for many small things because, uh, yeah, we're a community. We, ha we all have different knowledge. Um, and that was amazing and encouraging. Like, we got so far so quick, thanks to also people's help, people's comments, people's suggestions. And um, a random suggestion on one random ticket was helping like three other tickets. I, I mean, I remember one coming from Wim, for example, like, why don't you try this? He said, okay, let's try it. And we got a 50% increase just out of doing that. And I wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have been able to progress so quickly without the help of the community reaching out and people willing to, to help as well. An example I have is um, I was working on config validation things and I was really convinced that this was the one way to make it work. I went all the way in, I made a full proof of concept that worked. And then Fabian Bicher, maintainer of config split and other things and awesome reviewer was telling me like, but why are you doing it this other way? And I'm like, no, that can't work. And then after a lot of back and forth, I was like, damn. You're right, I wish I had known this and understood this weeks ago. It would have saved me a lot of time. So I went too far in a proof of concept direction. Didn't get enough feedback incorporated early enough. But it's better now. So uh, when we were starting to work on uh, the, the new toolbar, it's, it's at drupal.org slash project navigation, every little issue or every little change was managed individually through like drupal.org issues because that's how you would do it. But our goal it was to innovate very, very rapidly and test very rapidly. So we quickly kind of just made everybody maintainers and said, like, we're, not, we're not concerned with code quality at this point. We just want to see something so we can put it in front of people. So we encourage people to commit your own code, commit directly to the main branch, do this, just keep moving, keep momentum and, and, and make things happen. And that's been a, that's been a big effect on, on how, rapid we could how rapidly we could innovate. Um, for UX, it's, you know, like, usually you have like the common UX pitfalls where you know, when you don't have like enough participation or you don't have like a well-defined process that you just go back to assumptions, right? Um, so I think back in the past, um, we stumbled, you know, across multiple initiatives we have, like uh, over stuff, we just made assumptions and then we moved on with it because of, you know, can be time or effort or whatever. Um, and we really want to opt that with, you know, like the recent changes we did, you know, like on one huge part is also, for example, that Christina had like a whole, like half an year paid contribution to work on these things, right? Um, because, for example, I work always in my leisure time because I don't have company time to work on those things, right? Uh, as an example. So I think for designers, it's a bit harder to participate in some of the initiatives, and we, we need a way to solve that. And by um, creating like the user research, you know, validating things, building prototypes, getting it out there for you all to test it out, and collecting this feedback, uh, and then iterate over it to make it better is the way forward. And we sometimes lack that in, in the past, I would say. Thank you. Um, so multiple people are asking, that uh, how, what's going to happen to Drupal.org for developers? Is it going to be like a promotional site? So how, we, how will we retain the feeling of home for developers and at the same time being good for the market? And at the same time, is there any plans to localize it for multiple languages? 
Oh, <laughs> all good questions. I think we face this, like many of us, of course, work on website projects, and we often face this where there's a primary audience um, that we have to orient the website around, but there's this existing internal audience that is also really valuable. And what I often recommend on these projects is that we have really good wayfinding for the internal audience, in this case, the developers, that they have you know, the, page, the, the content they need, um, that you can find it, but that maybe it's not the first thing you see when you come to the site. Um, so we are going through actually right now, uh, going through a list of content that we're de-emphasizing and making sure that that's still there, that there's a path for that content, um, that there's still going to be uh, a way to find content if it's still useful, um, but that maybe it's not in the main navigation, maybe it's not um, highlighted on the home page. And so I think that that's the kind of thing we can expect. And in terms of localization, um, well, I think if we can reduce the number of really like priority landing pages and really say these are the, this is the content we really want to focus on for these external audiences, that's going to help make localization easier because it will be a smaller set of content that we say this is what really needs to be translated. Um, I think it would be amazing to, to localize a lot of Drupal.org, but I also want to be realistic about how much effort that is, and I don't think it's something we're going to see like in the next year. All right, thank you. Um, so one question for all of you, I think. So I don't, I don't think that we quite disclosed it, but I think three of us here are mostly sort of uh, funded to work on these things in our day jobs, and the other people are mostly funded by, somehow by their companies or doing it in their free time. So we are really a mix of different um, uh, sources of funding or, or, or uh, how we organize these contributions. So Jaideep asks how an individual can balance their billable project and contributing to Drupal in a meaningful way given the person has the right intent to contribute. So how would you balance that? I've been doing a lot of that. Um, it, it, you have to have a little bit of buy-in from your company, and uh, a lot of it is explaining the value to your company. You know, if your company is using Drupal, you want Drupal to be successful. Uh, not to mention, like one of one of the primary benefits for me um, doing a lot of Drupal core contribution is just just learning. A lot of the lessons that I've learned doing things like the Olivero menu system have directly contributed to billable projects and things like that. Um, it can raise the profile of your company, and, and that's, a, that's a positive thing. Uh, I know like at, at different companies I've worked at, you know, during, like the, during the sales process, they say, well, this person who's going to be working on your project has also worked on Drupal Core. They know what they're talking about. There's lots of benefits for the companies, but the company also needs, needs to make aware of that. That all being said, I, I also like um, contributing to core in, in, in projects is a great way to meet people. It's a great way to build enthusiasm with Drupal and the, that can carry you a long way. It's also very easy to burn out, especially if you're not getting paid to do this. So just, just be aware of that and just watch yourself and, and you know that's very important. I'm freelance, so I'm working on my free time, or we can consider as I don't pay license for Drupal, so I owe something to Drupal. Um, but uh, in order to, I wish I could be able to be better organized and to structure the team better so that everybody uh, can knows what um, he or she has to do and we can be more efficient. I think contributing really, in my experience, is, is a journey where you're taking little baby steps, little incremental steps towards, uh, you know, sitting up here and suddenly finding yourself as an initiative lead. <laughs> Still wild. But, you know, where it starts, I liked from Wim's presentation where he talked about low hanging fruit. And that first baby step for us was always a uh, client is reporting a bug. Okay, well, let's go find the source of the bug and fix it. 
okay, well, we're going to fix it. Let's, let's go ahead and send that upstream. We found an actual bug in a contrib project, and that gets you started, and it starts to get you to understand how the process of contribution works, which, like I said, is, is really so much of the battle. How, how does this work? How does this community handle this? Um, you know, and new feature requests, bugs and, and new feature requests. Oh, well, your client wants this. Well, your client's probably going to pay you for that feature. And if you send it upstream, that's wonderful news for, for everyone. So always thinking about, you know, if I wrote this in a slightly different way, could I send it upstream? You know, you, you get there with a mentality, and it's very incremental. So just um, if you're taking a step in the right direction, you'll get there. All right, so uh, this is all the time we had for questions, but all of these nice people will be around after and, of course, tomorrow. So if you are coming tomorrow, there's three options that you have on the contribution. They would really love to see you here. So first of all, there's the first time contributor workshop, which allows you to get to know the tools that we use uh, to contribute to Drupal, so all of the tools that are used to make all of these things happen. And second of all, there's the mentored contribution, where people, a lot of people, will be there to mentor you and help you pick issues and help you go through the process of contributing to specific issues and go through your hurdles. And there's finally the general contribution room, which is going to have topic tables for all of these initiatives and a lot more initiatives that we didn't have time for because these are really high variety of initiatives, but there's a lot more that you can contribute to tomorrow as well. And you can also graduate through these three teams. So if you are a first timer, you can go into the workshop, learn the tools and get hands-on help from mentors and then join one of these teams or pick one of these uh, groups to start with if you know the tools or know the process or already know which topics you would like to work on. And tomorrow it's all gonna be on the fourth floor where uh, contribution has been all week, uh, all of the rooms will be there. So see you there tomorrow and throughout the rest of the conference. Thank you.